All right, hello everyone, and welcome to New York Wine and Grape Foundation's New York State of Wine. So this is our final episode of the season. So thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today for a very special episode, Boldly Delectable, uh, where we explore the food friendly nature of the wines from New York State. So before we introduce the panel, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants. So we have a chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Uh, just be sure to select everyone in the two field as it can default to panelists only. And then there's the Q&A section. And this is where we'd like you to submit your questions to be answered by the panel uh, during the webinar. So now for introductions. Our host for today is Dan Belmont. Dan fell in love with wine while visiting the Finger Lakes wine region in New York State and has since worked as a brand ambassador and hospitality consultant for several notable Finger Lakes producers and the statewide industry and judged the New York State, of wine, New York State wine classic in 2019. He is a certified American wine expert and holds the level three certification in wine and spirits from the WSET. His decade plus of experience is the engine behind his latest work, Good Wine, goodpeople.com, delivering good wine UK wide. Previously, he led the education departments of NYC's famed Murray's Cheese, the largest artisan cheese retailer in the US, and the Dales of Borough, a trio of London wine bars. Dan currently lives in London with his wife, where he is the wine ambassador for Lieber UK and proudly supports a variety of international trade associations and producers as a presenter, educator, and judge. Now for our panelists, uh, we've got Mar Mario Mazza uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Mario went on to earn a master's degree in enology from the University of Adelaide in Australia. While there, he gained experience in the Barossa Valley and the Adelaide Hills. In addition to his early exposure to the family business, Mario has 15 years of experience in research and commercial winemaking, as well as sensory training, including the PA Wine Quality Initiative. Scott Osborne at Fox Run Vineyards. Prior to purchasing Fox Run in 1993, Scott spent some time in California working at various wineries until realizing his passion lay in cool climate wine. Scott has served as president of the Seneca Lake Wine Trail and is founding member and past president of Finger Lakes Wine Alliance. He is a founding member of the New York Wine Industry Association and serves as the New York representative on the board of Wine America, the national advocacy organization for the US wine industry in Washington, DC. Fox Run Vineyards is a family owned business that Scott co-owns with his wife, Ruth. Matthew Spaccarelli. Matthew graduated from Fordham University in 2006 with the dream of opening a farm to table restaurant in New York's Hudson River region. However, just that same year, his family bought Ben Marl Winery in Marlboro, New York and with practically no wine knowledge, Matt quickly got involved in the cellar. In 2013, after a few years of planting and managing various vineyards, Matt and partner Casey Erdman decided to start their own wine label focused on estate grown fruit. Fjord Vineyards has now earned four medals at the 2019 New York Wine Classic, including a gold for their estate grown 2018 Albarino. All right, so let's get started. Over to you, Dan. Thank you so much, Katie. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. Uh, that was a really long-winded bio about me, so I can skip a lot of this stuff here, uh, and we'll get right into our panelists and the wines. Uh, but I did want to give a quick shout that I just launched the New York Bottle Shop uh, here in the UK. So newyorkbottleshop.co.uk. Uh, is boasting the largest by the bottle offering of New York State wine in the United Kingdom. I'm super proud of it. Um, you can check out the site for more information on New York State, its wines, its regions. Uh, there's one more shipment that's held up at port, but uh, once we're at full strength, I will have 18 different bottles of New York State wine available, as well as some mixed collections too. And I'm looking to add more. So um, I'm really excited to, uh, to create a home for New York State wine in the United Kingdom. 
Uh, I'm a Long Island native, uh, born and raised, longtime resident of Astoria, Queens. Uh, let's go Mets. Uh, and I, I, like, as Katie said, I fell in love with New York. I fell in love with the people, the community, the wines. Uh, my experience there created the lens through which I see the rest of the wine world. Um, and so uh, a lot of my career has been consumer education uh, and a lot of uh, food and wine pairing too. Uh, and so I'm really excited to host today's uh, seminar. We have such a, a fun topic uh, and I have even better company. Uh, once again, our esteemed guests are the producers of the wines in this evening's flight. We have Mario Mazza, general manager and knowledgeist of Mazza Vineyards in Lake Erie. Super fun. We've got Matthew Spaccarelli, winemaker from Fjord Vineyards in the Hudson Valley. And we've got Scott Osborne, the co-owner and founder of Fox Run Vineyards in the Finger Lakes. So we've got three regions to talk about, three different wines uh, and three different food pairings. So um, we want this to be a conversation, not just between myself and the panelists, but with our guests too. Uh, please pop any questions that you might have into the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, and uh, we will make sure that we uh, tackle them all as we go through. Uh, and uh, Katie's gonna keep me honest to make sure I don't miss anything. Uh, finally, a big thank you to our host, the New York uh, Wine and Grape Foundation at New York Wines and NewYorkWines.org, and our three producers for taking time out of their schedules to join us today. Uh, the theme today: boldly delectable. Uh, and you know, we're we really just want to make you guys hungry. That is the the, the purpose of today's session. Uh, we hope that it's a great introduction uh, to the New York State region's styles, grapes, and producers uh, as we pair some simple snacks with today's wines. Uh, in search of pairing perfection, you know. Uh, in short, New York wines love food, and we're going to answer the why uh, as we chat and explore the grape varietals, uh, the terroir, and the styles of these three uh, wines and their corresponding regions. Uh, so without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first guest, Mario Mazza, who's the general manager and enologist at Mazza Vineyards, which is based in the Lake Erie American Viticultural Area. And so we're gonna kick this flight off with a very modest wine. Uh, it is the perfect rosé. Uh, and so, uh, hi Mario, how are you? I am well, Dan, and yourself? Fantastic, mate, thanks for joining us. Um, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us a bit about Mazza Vineyards and introduce the wine, and then from there we'll dive right into our pairing. All right, fantastic. So um, we are, uh, so, I think uh, Katie gave a great introduction to start uh, for me a little bit of background, but I came into a family business that uh, we're actually nearing 50 years in the wine business. Our operations in New York are, are nearing 20 years old. So we actually started on the Pennsylvania side of the border and uh, realized there's a lot of great things in New York to offer and kind of bridge the gap over there. Uh, I didn't originally plan to join uh, the family business myself uh, when I decided after finishing engineering and spending a little time in that space, talked to my father, he said, that's great go make mistakes with someone else's money first. Uh, some of the best heated advice I've, I've, I've had. Uh, so I went, uh, studied in South Australia and uh, rejoined the family business. So we've kind of expanded and, and developed. We're probably one of, you know, maybe a little bit more underdeveloped regions, uh, you know, in New York in some ways and in the East uh, Coast, but a lot of great potential, um, you know, so we have uh, multiple facilities. Uh, we actually also delve into spirits and beer. So we kind of do all things alcohol, actually. Um, wine still probably is my is my first passion. It's the thing that I that I really came up in. Um, so Lake Erie, uh, and I'm not sure if maybe we're going to pop to the map or, or come to that a little bit later. Um, uh, you know, for those, uh, you know, somewhat familiar, Lake Erie, we're kind of in the far hinterlands. Um, we're a, a solid seven hours from New York City. So no, it's not just outside the city. Uh, and we sit on, uh, again, one of the five Great Lakes, uh, one of the shallow, the shallowest Great Lake, um, though Ontario is slightly smaller, it's quite a bit deeper. Uh, and it's quite a large AVA. It actually is the only multi-state AVA. It, so that viticulture area runs through uh, Ohio and through Pennsylvania and into New York. There's about 30,000, uh, 35,000 acres of grapes grown uh, in that whole region. Uh, a lot goes into juice production, but there is still a significant amount of wine production in the, in the region as a whole. Um, some traditional vinifera varieties that many will be familiar with, uh, some Labrusca varieties, but then uh, the wine that we're tasting today is based out of a variety, uh, Chamberson, which um, most people probably are not familiar with. 
Um, so I don't know, we can probably jump right into a little bit about that wine because being first off the gate and holding everybody up from that pairing is probably not the best move. I'm ready, let's do it. So just a little about the wine, um, the Chambersen uh, grape, uh, French American hybrid. Um, it is, uh, you know, a variety that is planted throughout the East uh, traditionally you know, or I guess more associated with the red wine production uh, that it's very capable of in maybe some warmer regions. And so little context as to how we arrived at starting our rosé program here was a number of years ago, um, you know, I was really inspired by some of the rosés that I had other parts of the world and, uh, and tasted. Um, and uh, the reality was that when I came back to the U.S. about 15 years ago, uh, rosé, as we know it, I guess now is not maybe what was the forefront of uh, minds for uh, pink wine drinkers in the U.S. I think a, a thing like Zinfandel may have been a little bit too popular then. Um, so really looking to try to craft something that was going to be uh, inspirational. There was a wine that I think really sticks in my mind, at least as an early rosé that I had, Turkey Flat in the Barossa, makes a great uh, Grenache rosé. Uh, and I thought, well, how could we do this? And uh, another winemaker on our team at the time, we realized that Chambersen had this great acidity, didn't always ripen uh, for red winemaking in our region, maybe the way we'd like. And that acidity really lended itself to, uh, to rosé winemaking. So I'm seeing there's a couple questions in terms of, you know, popping up in the chat there. And so this is actually a press style. So we're not actually leaving this on the skin for very long. And it's really critical because the, the skin, uh, and you can't actually, uh, get quite a bit of color out of Chambersen if you're not careful. And so timing of pick and ensuring that we're working with vineyards and getting that fruit to the winery as quickly as possible is really essential to uh, dial that in. And we're just monitoring those press cuts constantly, adjusting on the fly on the floor to really hit that target color, flavor, and uh, acid balance. So um, it's really something that uh, we've, uh, we think we've started to hone over the past few years. Cool stainless ferment, really trying to keep the interventions low. Uh, really the goal is to keep it clean and let the fruit express itself, but just bright red berry fruit. Awesome. Mario, generally speaking, does the Chamberson have fairly thick skins compared to some of the European varietals we might be more familiar with? No, it actually, Chamberson has a little bit uh, thinner skins and uh, so they can break down pretty easily. The fruit is also prone to uh, shelling. So later in the season, if you're trying to hang it for red wine production, it'll, um, you know, if you get some cold nights, the berries will actually drop off. They can actually get pretty brittle. The rackets can get pretty brittle. They drop off. Um, so rosé winemaking actually works well for our, our grower partners as well because it allows us to pick the fruit a little bit earlier when it's in the right condition, right ripeness for rosé, retaining a little bit more of that acidity. Um, so we think everybody wins. Awesome. And in total time on skins? We really try to keep it minimal. So um, our goal is most of the, the vineyards that are, uh, that are going into this rosé are within about 10 to 15 minutes of the winery. Um, so we're really trying to time those picks so that it's showing up the winery, getting unloaded and going right to crushing and pressing. Um, so while in the press, we can always hold a little longer, but we don't want to leave it. Uh, again, this is machine harvested, so we don't want to leave that held. We want to get it to the winery quick, get it uh, kind of in our hands so that we can manage that. And if we need to hold in the press for a little bit, um, cap and hold that we can for maybe a little while, but really keeping that, uh, that contact time is actually pretty minimal Great. to um, extraction, just as long as it's really taken to process. Very good. Uh, do you typically uh, enjoy this wine with food? Uh, I enjoy, yeah, I enjoy this wine with food. It's a wine that actually also, you know, uh, on its own is, is a great sipper. Um, but I think, I think this wine and rosés in general, but I think they're really versatile, uh, in a lot of ways. And so that, uh, maybe that's for me, um, uh, trying it with different things. I think it's just, you know, something that, uh, I enjoy. I know we've got it paired with a, a salmon today, but, uh, I, you know, this time of year, uh, I love some, uh, you know, uh, grilled chicken, uh, as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, any of those, uh, you know, any summer friendly pairings are going to work great with this wine. So I have a little smoked salmon today. We're going to give it a try. You know, when you're really seeking after a great pairing, I really like to combine both things on my palate at the same time. 
while I'm still enjoying the food, take a sip of the wine. If you sip the wine and then try and eat the food, you might dribble on yourself. We're trying to have a nice time here. We're going to keep it classy. It's a joke. Um, anyway, uh, that worked out very well. You know, pairing, generally speaking, if you like the wine and you like the food that you're eating, there are only really a few pitfalls to look out for uh, in terms of, of ruining your experience by putting these two things together. And so, you know, as we kind of talk about, you know, uh, all the different pairing principles with these different things, it's important to note that these rules are 110% meant to be broken, right? Everyone's palate is different. The part of your palate that processes flavor, closely related to the parts of your palate that manage memory and, and emotions literally what makes you, you. Uh, and so, you know, uh, not everyone might enjoy all three of our pairings here, but hopefully it'll give us the opportunity to look at balance. And I think balance is the most important thing. Balance from a strength perspective, a strength of flavor, uh, balance of fat versus acid, which is playing incredibly well here. Um, balance of tannin versus protein, which is great, but a little texture in our rosé to play with. Uh, complementing fl flavors and contrasting flavors. So with complementing flavors, you know, thinking about your wine as a condiment for your food, essentially adding new elements to uh, the flavor profile and things that work well together. And then your contrasting flavors working with things like sweet and salty and sweet and spicy. Okay. Um, for here, we have a pretty intense smoke flavor from, from the salmon here, but I really think it just heightens the berry notes in the wine. Um, it is definitely a rich cut of salmon that I have here, and the acid is cutting through it incredibly well. Um, you know, the idea is that fat would weigh your palate down, uh, and the acidity will come in and then lift that fat up, break it down, and get you salivating. That's super important, getting you ready for your next bite your next sip, so on and so forth. Um, so Mario, beyond, um, rose, uh, beyond, sorry, beyond smoked salmon, what kind of pairing suggestions would you offer for this wine? Because you've got all the elements that uh, we need. You've got the acid, you've got talent, you've got some, some really nice fruit characteristic. Um, what's your go-to? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's terrible when asking that question, what's my go-to? Uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, what's my go-to wine, the glass in my hand? And what's my go-to food? Uh, I'm a little bit more mood dependent, but I, like I say, I think, you know, something with uh, grilled chicken, uh, you know, on the barbecue is great. Um, you know, maybe some grilled veggies uh, as well. Uh, uh, my wife loves to make quiche and I think quiche goes really well with this wine. So uh, you can kind of make that a little bit of a brunch uh, offering as well. I'm, I'm, I guess it's afternoon here, so it's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, no, those are, I think those are some of the things that, that work well and uh, it works. Yeah. Again, it's just such a versatile wine um, for, for me that it, it works great in so many instances. Uh, I guess probably also like to pair it, just sit and watch in the sunset over the water too is usually pretty nice. So for sure. For sure. Yeah, I think generally, you know, I'd be looking for salty foods. I'm looking for uh, like we've got smoke here. So I think anything grilled would work incredibly well. Anything with that little bit of like really savory umami char would go a long way to really just kind of kick the fruit up into overdrive. And, uh, and then you let that acidity do the work, which is which is great. Um, so, Mario, we had another question uh, about the chamber sin and kind of how it applies to your harvest. And I think this is a really nice segue uh, because what I want to do is kind of go around the room uh, and uh, kind of just introduce these three wine regions. And what we'll do is we'll end uh, with Matt and then go right into pairing number two from there. So, Mario, just kind of talk a little bit more about life growing grapes and making wine in the Lake Erie AVA, what is unique about that area, uh, particularly to you? And then the question specifically was kind of what proportion of, um, you know, your harvest is Chamberson, like in the vineyards, you know, how popular of a grape is it up there? Uh, what other wines and styles from Lake Erie would we expect to find? Um, yeah, go for it. Sure, sure. Very, very simple, uh, you know, easy <laughs> question there, Dan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, la yeah, Lake Erie, I mean, we are we are notorious for, uh, you know, our bitterly cold winters and, and lots of snow, but I, I love the cross-country ski and snowshoes, so I'm not going to complain. Um, what, what, but, kind of what kind of temp are we talking about? Like cold? What, how, how cold uh, is it? Yeah, so, you know, uh, below freezing regularly throughout, uh, you know, the winter and cold enough to to make ice wine. So down below, 
uh, that mid teens Fahrenheit, you know, minus 12, minus 15 Celsius. So that's not uncommon for us to get to. It does limit some of the varieties that we can grow here because of that cold hardiness factor. Um, so there, there's some, you know, consideration in terms of the viticulture here. The, uh, you know, area, area that works well for growing is going to be probably comparable to what Matt and Scott are going to talk about as well, but it's proximate to water where you're going to have that, uh, you know, that moderation effect from, from Lake Erie, from that warm body of water. Uh, it does tend to freeze in the winter still, but that's a benefit in the spring. We have a little bit of a delayed uh, bud burst, and so we uh, usually have a bit of frost and freeze pr uh, protection uh, during that time of year, although we had some growers that are a little further up the escarpment this year, they got uh, nipped a little bit with a cold event in May. So, um, you know, we tend to be a little bit more humid and wet climate. So, um, you know, disease management out in the vineyard are all considerations that we have to really think about with our with our grower partners as well. Uh, Chambersen for us, this rosé, it's a growing component of our program. So overall, um, you know, what I would say is we were not making dry rosé 10 years ago. Um, we have a couple different wines in the, in the overall portfolio across, uh, across everything we're doing, but uh, this year, uh, a little in excess of about 5,000 cases or so of, uh, of dry rosé that we're seeing. So really gaining some popularity and momentum, um, you know, is a grand scheme of percentage of, uh, you know, tonnage intake that we do uh, across everything, probably uh, about five or 6% of, of what we're bringing in overall. So, uh, but gaining some popularity, we've got a couple growers that are, we've asked them to expand our planting specific for, um, you know, for, for this wine and, and, and the wines kind of adjacent to it. Um, I noticed there's a couple other questions about the wine. So Mallow for this wine, MLF, we we're not intentionally conducting mallow. Uh, I tend to feel that that broadens the palate a little bit too much for the, the style that we're really aiming to achieve. So after, uh, you know, alcoholic primary fermentation is done, we're, uh, we're sulfuring, clearing the wine up relatively uh, uh, quickly. Um, again, this is a, you know, a little bit cooler ferment, obviously retaining that fruit. Um, residual is just a few grams per liter, and that's all natural just from the arrested ferment. Um, just kind of gives it a little bit of palate weight there. Yeah, it's, it's opening up really well. I'm getting a lot of um, like a, a watermelon candy note. Um, I, I don't know if it'll translate uh, to the, the European folks here, but but a watermelon Jolly Rancher, it, it's kind of spot on. Uh, and uh, uh, but but the really nice acidity that just kind of keeps keeps kind of going. Long finish, continue to salivate, really nice, bringing you back for your next bite, your next sip, so on and so forth. That's awesome. Fantastic. Uh, Scott, I'd love to hear from you uh, and kind of talk about what makes the Finger Lakes uh, uh, unique also as compared to uh, to what Mario is working with up in Lake Erie. Um, how are you doing today? Wonderful. I was just checking the wind. I was looking out my window and I, I was watching the, uh, one of the umbrellas and I said, hmm, better check the wind. Don't want those taken off on me. But uh, Seneca Lake is one of the deeper lakes in, uh, in the continental United States. So the last time it froze was 1912. So that has a, a huge effect on the vineyard surrounding uh, Seneca. And, um, you know, we, in the wintertime, it sort of acts like a 40 degree Fahrenheit um, heater. And it keeps the winter temperatures um, usually about five degrees warmer than, um, you know, just on the other side of the hill, for instance. Um, low temperatures, you know, we can see minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit here, um, you know, which is one of the reasons we have Riesling planted and Cabernet Franc and Lemberger and Chardonnay because they can withstand those, those colder temperatures. Um, so, it, uh, you know, it's, the Finger Lakes is challenging. Um, this year is sort of turning out to be the, um, as I say, you know what comes after two days of rain in the Finger Lakes? Monday. <laughs> Without you know, fail. <laughs> we, uh, um, it always rains on September 25th, you know, right in the middle of Chardonnay harvest. So um, that's pretty much what's going on here. Cool. And what are you guys working on today? What's kind of happening in the life cycle of, of the vineyard right now? Well, we're sitting right at the beginning of bloom. Uh, one of the things about Seneca Lake is it's so cold that it that it re, uh, retards bud break until hopefully after the last frost. So we don't get bud break until May 10th or May 15th. And then we are right at the beginning of bloom. 
So Chardonnay is starting to bloom. Riesling is going to start any day now. Um, we'll get berries set usually around the first first week of July, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's you know we just try to keep up with Mother Nature. Scott, do you uh, do you guys make a rosé? We do. We uh, we uh, have a Pinot Noir Limburger um, blend for our rosé. Very cool. Um, Great. Uh, and then moving further south, and Katie, if you could do me a favor, just throw up the map one more time so we could just kind of look in proximity. Uh, of the three regions, but I want to hear from Matthew telling us about life in the Hudson Valley. So the Hudson River region is, uh, it's a fairly large uh, AVA, a uh, little over, I think, 90,000 hectares. Um, however, it's probably uh, one of the smaller acreage plantings um, in the New York AVAs. Um, I don't have an exact number, but I would say it's probably under 200 hectares of, of winemaking grapes. Um, there are some table grapes and uh, juice grapes, Labrisca being grown as well. Um, most of those wineries, uh, vineyards are located um, within about two miles three kilometers from the river itself. Uh, unlike Seneca Lake, like Scott was saying, um, it's not really the water in the river that's moderating the temperatures, but it's the shape of the valley itself acts as a conduit of um, warm uh, Atlantic Ocean air that kind of gets funneled up through the valley. Uh, it's fun. At my dad's farm kind of overlooks the river and uh, here in New York, we have kind of a west to east weather pattern, weather pattern most of the time. Um, and sometimes you see those clouds going up and then you see the funnel of air kind of crossing it. I like to think of it as like, a, you, know, you have the traffic going one way and the subway going another way. Um, you, you have these kind of two, two different flows of air. Um, and that's kind of what moderates things for us. Um, we're located uh, right about right in the middle of the ADA about, um, 90 miles north of New York City. Um, we manage about like just around 40 acres uh, in total. Uh, so, Very good. How about you tell us about your wine? We're going to move into wine number two now. This is the Albarino. So this Albarino, it's a kind of an experimental block we put in in 2013. Um, most people are more familiar with, you know, uh, Galicia and Close to Spain uh, with Albarino, they don't really think uh, New York or the Hudson Valley uh, for that matter. Um, but we thought, you know, it, it does well in, in kind of wetter climates. Um, we knew we were going to be pushing the limits as far as cold hardiness goes. Um, but it seemed to do pretty well. Uh, it's done a little bit heavier soils. And that's a west facing slope. And um, as far as the 2019 vintage, uh, we had about around two, harvested around two tons to the acre. It's a very, very small clustered variety um, with really thick skins. Um, so press yields are really low. Um, and trying to think 2019 vintage, it was all hand harvested around a four hour cold soak on the skins. So we'll dry ice the bins, crush into there. Um, Albarino tends to be an extremely phenolic variety, uh, especially for white wines. And um, after working with it for a couple of years, we thought, well, instead of trying to fight those phenolics, let's embrace them. Um, you know, uh, the wine, because the, the skins are so thick, there's kind of like no avoiding it. So we didn't really want to strip stuff, trying to, trying to get rid of them. So um, we do that cold soak again, three to four hours and then press off. Um, it's all done in stainless steel. Uh, no, no malolactic fermentation and kind of quick to the bottle. Uh, so it is singing right now. Um, yeah. Probably, yeah. Probably in the glass for mm, 35 minutes or so. Um, really good temperature still uh, and has really, really opened up. Um, I mean, you got a lot of really nice citrus fruit on the underpinning, nice minerality all the way through, really kind of nice tropical fruit characteristics on the mid palate. Uh, and that acid is just a live wire. Really, really cool. Yeah, it's interesting to, um, you know, when you look at the chemistry at harvests, um, you know, 
as these guys know, harvest is such a busy time. And like you look at bricks right away and then you wait for the other lab work to kind of come through. And um, it, it ripens really well here. Um, we don't have any issues with botrytis or sour rot like we do with, with Riesling or some other varieties. Um, so it can, it can hang on pretty long, but it really retains its acidity. I think we have uh, over seven grams per liter uh, of acid and we're picking at probably 24 and a half bricks. And um, the pH stays nice and, and low. So uh, you have that kind of, um, I was excited when you were pairing this um, with the pork scratchings because I always like to have it with, you know, uh, kind of fatty, oily foods because it's got that tannin and it's got the acidity, you know, it's, it has both of those. So, uh, you know, I tend to think like sardines, uh, like fresh sardines or maybe a uh, grilled swordfish, something that, that has a lot of fat and almost gaminess yeah. to it. And it kind of keeps it all in check. Um, I actually made a, a swordfish, a swordfish ceviche over the weekend. Uh, and this would have been just a delight with it really. Um, but today I do have my, my Mr. Trotters, I cut his head off, but Mr. Trotters, uh, triple cooked pork scratchings here. Uh, also known as pork rinds, depending on where you are or chicharrones. Uh, so I also had a little bit of a, a kind of Spanish influence in there I thought would be fun, um, but really um, looking for salt to kick up our fruit, looking for acid to cut through the fat, uh, and I thought this would be a really fun way to do it without, um, you know, having a slow cooked pork belly for eight hours or something like that. So uh, let's give it a try. Everybody watch me eat. Scrub. Mm -hmm. really meaty, really, really um, just kind of feels a little dirty doing it. It's, it's really good. <laughs> These are so nice. They're, um, the, the pork scratchings are almost, they're almost not dry. I mean, they got an incredible crunch, but they've got a lot of moisture to them in that fat. Um, and um, I'll tell you, you take a sip of that wine and it just clears your palate uh, almost immediately. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of um, almost barbecue flavors, kind of, um, you know, grilled flavors kind of kicking up, kind of high toned, uh, but really just along the palate is just a straight line of acidity and, and energy from the wine, which is, uh, is working really, really well. Uh, Matt, what else would you uh, typically look to, to pair this wine with? Um, I like kind of like nutty cheeses, almost like a before uh, that kind of like pecorino or aged gouda. Um, kind of you're talking about juxtaposing it with flavors or complementary flavors. And it's the wine's got that like bit of that like beeswax kind of um, nose on it. And I think that kind of goes well with those kind of um, real nutty flavors. And then again, you have most of those nutty uh, cheeses or have really nice salinity to them. <laughs> you know, yeah, they, I'd, be looking for, I'd be looking for sheep's milk cheeses. Uh, I think it'd be great. Pecorino being, being one uh, for sure, but like Manchego, uh, an yeah. aged Manchego with this would be really, really good. You got all that salt. You've got all that kind of barnyardiness, which, uh, which as we've seen with our pork trotters play, uh, pork, Mr. Trotter's pork scratchings, <laughs> very different dish, uh, play really well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'd be looking for, for aged manchegos. Uh, if we want to go French, we could go a cheese called Oso Irate. Um, and the old ones, Oso Irate VA, which is kind of an Alpine style sheep's milk, which is, which is really awesome. Um, and you'll get a lot of that kind of nuttiness. Um, you know, even things like, like Comte could work really well. I'd go for like a really kind of heavy aged Comte uh, so that you're getting a little bit more of that, that barnyard and that kind of gamey quality in there. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'd have a winner. Awesome. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, Scott, Mario, any other, any other, do you guys, um, do you guys, do you have any junk food pairings? That's a good question. Like high, talk, talk to me like highbrow, lowbrow. Pizza. Yeah, man. <laughs> Very Pizza good. Pizza goes with just about everyone. It's true. Mario, what are you thinking? Um, um Junk food, oh man, yeah, just whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever, something crispy and salty chip variation that might be might be kicking around that I probably shouldn't keep as many in the uh, in the cupboard as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Matthew. We're going to turn over to my man Scott with Fox Run for our final wine. Uh, and then I just really just kind of want to talk food at the table, um, you know, what we're excited to eat right now, summer wise, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Scott, did you know that I was almost your tasting room manager at one point? I think I remember that <laughs> a number uh, of years I, ago. I had been in, in long talks with uh, with Ruth, uh, and um, ultimately yeah. my wife took the job that that brought us to London. So that's the only reason that yeah. didn't play out. <laughs> that's right. I remember yeah. that now. Awesome. And so, what do you have for us today? You have a Chardonnay. Chardonnay, and and a little background on the Chardonnay. I uh, it's from our Kaiser Vineyard, which is named after our vineyard manager, and it's still this uh, it's still this oldest planting on the farm. But um, you know, I came back from California where I, I learned how to make wine and, and um, I was visiting family and just decided to take some tour through the Finger Lakes. And uh, this is about 1984 and stopped in at Wagner's. At that time, there were only about 20 wineries in the Finger Lakes and stopped at Wagner's, tasted their uh, 1982 Chardonnay. And it was the first real experience I ever had with a cool climate Chardonnay. And, and I just, it was like an epiphany. And I said, wow, I'm, I'm gonna go back back to uh, uh, Byron, give notice, and, and I'm moving to the Finger Lakes to make cool climate wines. Cause uh, I have all my wine, I drink most of my wine with food. And, you know, to me, these cool climate wines were like perfect um, to, to have with food and, and your meal. So packed up my bags, came back here, um, eventually, uh, Fox Run became available and we purchased it in 1994. Um, and I wanted to make this style of wine, this uh, uh, barrel fermented, aged in oak barrels, um, you know, with the acidity that we get here in the Finger Lakes. Um, it, there's a much longer longevity in terms of aging. Um, after about 10 years, they, they, they developed this very soft smoothness that's, that's really beautiful. So this wine was um, fermented in oak barrels. We, we ferment in um, French, uh, American, and uh, a small amount of Hungarian oak barrels. Um, usually in 10 months, goes through malactic, uh, sits on the lees uh, pretty much that whole time. And then we bottle it. We try to bottle it in late August, early September, so that we can have, have the tanks and the barrels ready for the next vintage coming in. Scott, was there something particular about the fruit from this vineyard that said this should be this barrel fermented style? Um, we initially, there was a lot of Chardonnay on this, this farm. The original owners, wanted to be a sparkling wine house. So they planted mostly Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, we started making this wine right off the bat in uh, 1994. And it, it seemed to have the most consistency um, from year to year as over the years that we began to, to uh, make more and more wine from it. Uh, the first five rows go to our block to block um, sparkling, and then the, the, the next five acres or uh, two hectare go, um, go into this. The, they're the older vines. Uh, we, we just love the fruit that comes off of here. And so this is not the only Chardonnay you make. You also do just kind of your standard label, your not reserved label rather, is uh, an un-oak style, correct? Correct. And uh, we buy the grapes from uh, the Doyle family. Mm -hmm. um, they, they bought the old gold seal vineyards. They're the oldest uh, vinifera vines planted in, in New York. And uh, so we get, uh, we get a substantial amount of, of grapes from them for our un-oak Chardonnay and, and we started making the un-oak Chardonnay in I think it was 95 or 96 because we started to realize that, you know, back then it was ABC, 
anything but Chardonnay. And, you know, people just didn't like the big oaky styles that were being made uh, on the West Coast. So we started making this unoaked Chardonnay that just took right off. And now it's our number one selling wine. So. Well, what's really nice about this is, you know, the oak is giving you those kind of secondary flavors, your touch of vanilla, your bit of baking spice, riper kind of fruit, softer fruit characteristics, your tree fruit, your apple, stuff like that. Um, but the acid is just balanced perfectly. I mean, really, uh, it is not the heavy, you know, style, the heavy oak style that that brought about the, the ABC crew. It's really, um, I, I love Chardonnay. Uh, and, uh, I think this, you know, when you can do it in balance, I think that's one of the, um, real keys of a cool climate growing region is that you can balance with acid and it makes all the difference. Well, 1995, um, I realized actually it was 1994. I realized that, um, I either had to run the company or I had to hire, uh, and make the wines or I had to hire a winemaker, uh, who could make better wine than I did. And, uh, that I, I found Peter Bell and and he's just does spectacular work with with Chardonnay. Oh, I've recently done some other ones, but uh, legend. Chardonnays are right up my alley. And it turns out that when I started dating my my wife, that she was a Chardonnay fan also. So it, uh, you know we we all had this beautiful match uh, um, here at the winery. Mm -hmm. My wife falls into the ABC camp, uh, but then I just stopped telling her what I was pouring for, so it's fine. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, Scott, we got a couple of questions for you, um, particularly on the kind of breakdown of the oak treatment. Uh, for instance, if you missed out on Hungarian oak, how would the wine change? Uh, we use a small amount of Hungarian. We think that uh, Hungarian gives some real, uh, a much better palate feel um, to the wine. Um, I don't, it's just sort of one of the things we've fallen into over the years and, and I have no idea what would happen if we took it out. <laughs> uh, that would be an interesting experiment. Yep. Uh, and do you know what clone you guys are using for the Fox Run? For the, for the reserve? No. Nope. It was uh, here when we got here and, uh, you know, it's, there's all sorts of rumors where it came from. So. So we're pairing this today with some goat cheese uh, and the uh, recommendation that we got uh, from one of Scott's cheesemonger contacts in New York was the Garocha. And Garocha is a Spanish uh, semi-firm goat's milk cheese. It comes in a little... It almost looks like um, like the things that they slide on the ice for curling, all right? It's about that size, not, not too big, less than a kilo. Uh, and uh, it has a very soft, velvety uh, mottled rind on the outside. Uh, and it's actually a mold that you typically don't want on a lot of cheeses. It's not the most attractive mold. Uh, it almost looks like gray kind of cat fur as it grows. And so very unattractive on something like a brie, right? Um, but um, the cheesemaker there uh, let it run wild and then simply pats that mold down to create the rind. Uh, and it's, you almost want to snuggle with it. it. It's so kind of soft and delightful. Uh, on the inside, though, um, you know, the paste is probably aged for four to six months, give or take. And so I have uh, what's called a, a tome de chèvre, a French uh, a goat milk cheese. Uh, and so very kind of similar, kind of pliable, but firm, firm style cheese for the goat milk. Um, and goat's milk, generally speaking, has uh, higher acidity uh, than uh, cow and sheep counterparts. Uh, also has less fat and protein than cows and sheep. Uh, it's also missing the, the beta carotene, which would turn cows and sheep's milk cheeses uh, yellow or even orange. Uh, so your goat's milk, they're always going to be this bright white paste. Um, and so this one, um, has a lot of that very traditional goaty tang. Uh, it immediately turns creamy. It's also quite room temperature on my plate at this point. So it's making it difficult to speak. And that's where the wine comes in, folks. So we'll get me back in a second. Hmm. Very good. Just looking at our questions, making sure. Uh, Scott, how many uh, cases of this Chardonnay do you guys make traditionally, typically? 
We usually make about 2,500 uh, cases of this. Great. Mm -hmm. It varies mm -hmm. from year to year, sometimes uh, depending on the year. I mean, we get down about 1,200 and then up to 25, so. Awesome, very good. So we've got some time left. I kind of just want to open it up and have a conversation, get you guys actually talking to each other because I know you don't get the opportunity to do this very often either. Uh, and so, um, you know, things to kind of think about again, you know, um, what New York State has in terms of a cool climate uh, and, you know, the varietals, the varieties that are, that are gonna be planted for that reason typically are varieties that are going to produce your high acid uh, and, you know, even things like Chardonnay because of that cool climate are going to give you that acidity. Uh, and that's really the kind of main component that you need for, for balancing that, that fat and that acidity. Um, you know, we've got some great um, red wine varieties that we're not tasting today. But even then, we're talking lighter bodied reds, we're talking Pinot Noir, we're talking Cabernet Franc, uh, Lemberger, as you mentioned. Um, and, you know, and these are going to be kind of medium tannin wines, but with a lot of kind of potential uh, for working across all your different proteins. Um, there, there's so much to work with, guys. So talk to me about, you know, what's on your, your dinner table? What, 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 what do we look forward to in summer that's available now that wouldn't be available the rest of the year? Um, what are you guys having for dinner tonight? Let's let's get it. Well, I can I can jump right in there. Um, summertime usually it's Riesling drier styles. Uh, you know we do one we call Sylvan, which is actually barrel uh, barrel fermented in old oak barrels um, with no flavor. So we're searching for the palate feel that I like to drink that a lot. Um, you know, getting into the fall. You know that Lemberger and Cabernet Franc. We've uh, here at Fox Run. We've, you know, it, I always believe that if you're on Seneca Lake, you should be growing vinifera. You let the the other stuff be grown on other lakes. Um, so we we focused in on four grape varieties: Chardonnay, Riesling, and then on the Reds, Cabernet Franc and Lemberger as our. Uh, you know, those are the primary grapes that we grow here and make uh, what we feel are really really good wines. All of them great with food. Um, there. We have, uh, so available here in the UK, we have your dry Riesling and uh, the un -oak Chardonnay, uh, which are both available at that newyorkbottleshop.com uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and um, I paired the Chardonnay recently uh, and I, I posted it to Instagram and now I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain for, for what it was, uh, but really just a wonderful kind of pure expression of Chardonnay, just really fruit expression with really uh, no other, you know, intervention in terms of winemaking style, no oak, nothing like that, stainless steel fermented. Uh, it is pure and clean and really is, is quite versatile at the table. Uh, I want to thank our audience for some questions. We've got, um, here's a good one that'll kick us off. Um, you know, for you guys, when you serve uh, flights in your tasting room, are you typically also giving people little bites of food with them or you just go wine on its own? What do you think, Matt? We have, so we have kind of an a la carte menu with a couple different uh, locally sourced cheeses here in New York, um, a little bit of charcuterie. Um, and then, um, we always have olives on the table. So we have a couple of those offerings as well, but yeah, it's kind of a choose your own adventure with that. We don't have like a set pairing of, Hey, we're going to pour this wine with this, uh, cheese per se, or this wine with this meat. Um, it's, it's really kind of a general group of, of foods that pair well with uh, a couple of our wines. So. Awesome. Matt, while I have you, Patricia noted uh, or asked about the alcohol content on this wine, uh, the Albarino, and it's 13.9 on the label. Is that typical for um, uh, your Albarino or is this special for the vintage? Where do you guys usually end up? It's, it's very typical. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of waiting for all those flavors to develop in the vineyard. And I was saying before, um, fruit wise, it's pretty indestructible come harvest. Scott was mentioning, you know, September, you know, some storm gets pushed up the Atlantic and, and dumps a lot of rain on us. And um, the Albarino really, really holds up well. So we can, we can let it hang until we're getting those flavors that we want. Um, 
it's it's really low yielding vineyard, so we don't we don't want to really be dropping fruit. Um, so just kind of once those flavors develop, we're typically in that 24, 24 and a half breaks um, realm, which is going to translate to that higher 13, you know, alcohol. Um, I think one vintage we were 14.1 or something like that. But I feel like the, because we're, we're letting it spend some time in the skins and has a lot of tannin, it can kind of soften the heat um, in, in a way. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Mario, what is your, your tasting room experience like? Yeah, so uh, it varies. There'll be certain events where, uh, you know, we will incorporate some food pairings, sometimes specific to wine, sometimes available. Uh, you know, the, the location for Mazda's Taco Cellars actually is New York's uh, first combination winery brewery distillery. So we have our, our sister operations, brewery and spirits there as well. So wide range, we have, uh, some guest, um, you know, food partners and food trucks that range in. So, uh, it's a little bit more, uh, I don't know, maybe freewheeling the, uh, the, the craft beer and spirits kind of, uh, uh, play into that, but makes it a little bit more of a relaxed environment. So we do do a lot. Uh, well, I guess, uh, you know, BC before COVID did a lot more uh, pairing events with uh, local restaurants, either on their site or, or at our uh, locations um, and smaller uh, pairings that would include uh, food and for a, a group. So, yeah, we're looking forward to bringing a lot of that back because some of that has gone away uh, recently in some ways, but, uh, you know, always uh, some variants of offerings available. Awesome. And Scott, you guys have a deli right in your tasting room. Right. Yep. Um, and one of the things about uh, our, our cafe is basically we, we want simple, easy to prepare uh, foods. You know, we don't want to be white tablecloth or anything like that because, you know, I believe people should be drinking, um, drinking wine uh, with all their foods. Um, we do offer two, two levels of tasting. Well, actually, probably even more than that. But the two basic levels are one is just a tasting of five different wines. You know, you sit at the tasting bar, um, you know, and somebody will, uh, one of our staff will talk to you about the wines. And then we have uh, an, an upgraded one where you have the five wines plus five different little foods to go along with it. Um, and we find that, you know, it's about a 50-50 mix. You know, there's some people who want the food along with it, and then there's some people who don't. So, okay. Very good. Uh, we have another question kind of unrelated to our topic, but I think it's, it's a really important one, um, and it can kind of apply to each of your regions. You know, uh, it's, it's the elephant in all of these webinars. Uh, how is climate change affecting, uh, affecting your region? Is it in a, you know, in a cool place like New York, is it good? Is it bad? What do we think? Let's go back to you, Matt. So, so one thing that we're seeing, um, you know, what, what, we've been in the game for, for 15 years now, um, but just kind of, uh, I'm a Hudson Valley native. So, you know, I've, I've experienced outside of the wine industry here, um, but, you know, just, just looking at the, the data, yes, things are, are getting a little bit warmer. Are we gonna start planting, you know, to not, no. Um, but one thing we are seeing though is still you have maybe a little bit earlier bud break, but we're still getting late frosts. Uh, we had our earliest bud break this year. We had our latest frost last year. Um, the winters seem to be a, a lot milder, um, less snowfall than 20 years ago, um, but we're still getting that random, you know, um, forget the term now, Arctic plunge or whatever they call it, where we're getting down to, you know, negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, is it really shifting what we can grow? I don't really think so, but it is shifting perhaps the styles of wine that we can make, you know, maybe getting our Cab Franc a little bit riper and um, a little bit more structure to it, um, things like that. So yes, it, it's changing. I, I wouldn't say for the better, um, just because it, 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 it can make things a little bit more challenging, especially on the, the, the tail of the season, uh, whichever way you're looking at it, the beginning of the season, when, when you have early bud break and still the possibility of, of a really late frost. Mm -hmm. Mario? 
Yeah, I was just going to say, Matt, what you're saying, I think there's, you know, we're seeing just some more variability. We've got um, within, uh, you know, 30 minutes of us, either side, there's two joint uh, research labs between uh, Penn State and Cornell, and they have great weather data going back a half century. And there's a warming trend, but that variability thing that Matt talks about is actually the, the concerning part. So those earlier bud breaks, but we're still not at a frost risk. Um, we've got those, those polar vortexes, I think, Matt, was the thing you were going um, and we, we had two bad ones in winter 13, 14 and 14, 15 that uh, decimated crops down here along the Lake Erie region. But I think there's pretty significant damage in, in Finger Lakes and other regions as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's more tenuous again. Yeah, no, uh, no Tanat, Malbec or uh, anything crazy like that going in right now. It's, um, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Oops. Just cut out for a second there. Repeat just the last sentence one more time, Mari. You froze. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's, you know, we're uh, we're not seeing any wholesale changes. I think you're trying to just really identify those best sites uh, to manage um, what you are going to grow and, and hopefully be able to have some consistency in that, um, but knowing that you have to manage for those extremes to a degree still. Yep. And Scott, what's the Finger Lakes take? Yeah, uh, pretty much what both uh, both uh, Mario and Matt said. Um, you know, having been here since the early '90s, um, you know, back then we never had to worry about um, an early frost, you know, or a late frost. I mean, in in the spring because the lake would stay so cold. Well, in the last 10, 12 years, like that, maybe fifteen. Um, we've had warmer winters on average and the lake is staying warmer. So we're starting to see earlier bud break. Um, I had to go out and buy, uh, you know, a wind machine. So to, for frost protection that, you know, I don't think there was a wind machine set up in the Finger Lakes until 10 years ago. So, you know, it's, uh, that's pretty obvious. Um, then, you know, as, the Alberta Clipper, you know, it's always warms up in January here. We get a week of 50, 60 degree temperatures. Those are starting to last a little longer, but then we get this Alberta Clipper that comes down and it can drop 20 or 30 degrees in, in just a matter of uh, two or three days. And, and that can create uh, some significant damage um, because of that, because of the warming that's happening during the winter. Scott, I revisited the, the pairing with the goat cheese again, and I thought uh, it's super interesting. Uh, the wine really kicked up the sweeter notes in the cheese. So, you know, you eat the cheese on itself. It's a lot of that grass. It's a lot of kind of acidity. And then with the wine, it actually really opened up uh, to be almost something kind of reminiscent of like white chocolate, which was really, really fun. Uh, and I think, you know, when it comes to pairing, you know, just kind of in a, in a bit of a summary is, you know, you, you want funny math, you want one plus one to equal three, you know, I want these two things to come together, be better together than when they were individuals. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes the wine elevates the food. Sometimes the food elevates the wine. Every once in a while, you get a really true transformation and it's super exciting, you know? And so I think, you know, based on, on our, our conversation here is, you know, you guys are not making wines deliberately to pair with food. You are making wines that are appropriate for the terroir of your regions and what the varieties that you planted called for. Uh, and we have the benefit of this cool climate that is giving us this natural kind of through line of acidity. And so, uh, you know, in closing, New York State wine is really great with food and should be part of your table. It should be there like the salt, the pepper, and the ketchup, you know. Uh, it, it, uh, it, uh, really um, uh, can be exciting. And so, you know, again, with that, I don't put too much weight into food pairings. I don't, uh, I was actually listening to a podcast the other day and the title of the podcast was like bullshit and wine, excuse my, excuse my French. Uh, and one of the things that they ended on was, was food pairing. And it's true. It, it really comes down to, if you like these two things, chances are you're going to like them. You know, if you can understand these kind of principles of balance, you hopefully be able to identify why things don't work, right? And just things to avoid, to avoid those pitfalls. Um, and so uh, we've got, I got another question and it's just basically about my experience in London. 
and I get asked all the time, why would you ever leave New York City for London? And I was like, guys, you don't get it. It's, it's delightful here. <laughs> and, and one of the things I always lead with, because I know it's going to confound people, is, is the weather. And it's just so much more moderate here. You know, I visited New York uh, twice in 2019, and it was negative 14 degrees Celsius in February, and it was 39 degrees Celsius in August. I did not particularly enjoy the weather either time. <laughs> uh, where here, yes, I'm I'm constantly wiping my brow because it's you know above above 80 degrees. Um, my conversions are terrible, but uh, uh, there's no air conditioning here. But but generally speaking, um, yeah, this and I think the last really hot summer we had was 2018 here. Uh, in 2018, uh, vintage for English wineries is known because people actually made some halfway decent red wine, which is pretty cool. <laughs> All right. I think we are just about time. I think we've got all of our questions. Uh, gentlemen, any last uh, words, any last messages? Um, I want to thank you guys so much for the chat. I've had a really good time. Uh, Scott, I'll give it to you uh, just to, to say a little salutation. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, last night I had a, um, we did a mixed green salad with some triple cream creme brie and some Riesling dressing. We use verjou with all our uh, salad dressings, and it was just a fabulous match. And uh, I want to thank you and the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for letting me speak here today. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. That's awesome. Thank you, Scott. Mario, over to you. Uh, no, just same uh, expression of thanks and gratitude, Dan, to you and to the, the Wine and Grape Foundation and, and Matt Scott. Pleasure uh, sharing with you and, and uh, happy to share uh, probably a, a lesser known variety with uh, those outside of the region. Super fun, for sure. Matthew, my man. Yeah, just thank you to everyone. And, um, you know, this just being in a pretty diverse wine uh, we we're talking about this a little bit before we went live is just in New York is, is such a diverse place and, and the wines can be so, um, so different. I was thinking about, you know, for Fjord Vineyards, we make a Cabernet Franc Rosé and Scott was talking about his Pinot Lemberger Rosé. And then we had the Chamberson from, from Mario and um, just that whole, the, all the, I think Rosés kind of sum up New York and, and how, you know, different things can be. And um Maybe it'd be fun one day to be tasting a flight of all those kind of from Long Island to, to Lake Erie and in between. So, but thank you for having us and uh, thanks for everyone who joined. Awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, the diversity of the state and its different regions and its, its kind of extensive history creates for a situation that is very difficult to try and pack into one little tidy package. It, it, really, it really doesn't work. Um, and so for me, you know, I always recognize the state as a, um, you know, kind of young frontier for, for experimentation and also, you know, um, and, and it works because it's one of the premier terroir driven wine growing, you know, areas of the East Coast, it's really the best one, in, in my humble opinion. Um, you know, it's really the, the kind of intersection of, of, of everything you want. Um, in terms of terroir. So uh, guys, thank you so much. Um, it was my absolute pleasure to lead today's class. I hope you found a new favorite wine, a new grape, uh, or at least some, some decent pairing inspiration. Uh, I'm gonna go have dinner now. Um, if you have any additional questions you'd like to ask offline of any of the producers or myself, please don't hesitate to connect, to connect with the team at the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. You could get them at New York Wines or uh, newyorkwines.org. Uh, and you could find me on Instagram, dbcheesynyc and good wine x good people uh don't forget to check out that new york bottle shop here in the uk thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of the week thanks dan cheers everybody cheers, cheers. thank you thank you dan thanks to our panel um i'm definitely ready for some food and wine for sure uh, a recording of today's webinar will be published to our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And all of you participants will receive an email with that link. Uh, so special thanks to all of you who continue to tune in throughout the duration of this series. Uh, we hope the sessions were informative and, and drummed up some excitement uh, about New York wines. So we have um, additional online programming coming down the pike uh, for the second half of the year uh, with an all new format. So stay tuned for more details on that front. And in the meantime, take good care and enjoy the start to your summers, hopefully with a glass of New York 
statewide. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.